and I want to move fairly, if we can, move fairly quickly. Now, because Hume has already brought up, how am I doing on time, actually? Am I just about out? Because I know everybody's starving, so I don't want to go on. All right. Everybody, uh, it, it, Hume was brought up earlier. It was wisely agreed that you can't derive an ought from an is, and you can't read off the oughts from biology and blah, blah, blah. And although I dearly love Hume, you know, I think what he had in mind is something like this. That a certain practice exists, say, infanticide amongst the Inuit, doesn't thereby entail that we ought to do it. All right, fine. However, I think that that's all you can say about it. And the litany that we constantly hear from philosophers about you can't derive an ought from an is, and we, the philosophers, get to do the normative stuff because we're deep and have a very here, Peter Atkins and I are on the same page, alas. Uh, whereas the scientists can do what is the case, but we do what is what ought to be the case. Just crap. Our natures constrain our values and how we refine existing values. I think reasoning about social practices, say infanticide or cannibalism or whether to treat an expensive burn unit, illegal aliens caught in the fire. Reasoning about social practices is probably a constraint satisfaction process. One that we kind of understand in, guess what, the perceptual domain. Just as much of scientific reasoning is not, in any sense, deduction and induction, this is again a myth that philosophers like to, uh, like to peddle, um, it really has to do with inference to a good uh, hypothesis relative to my background beliefs, which is then revisable. Sometimes following Peirce, that gets called abduction. Sometimes following psychologists, it's called case-based reasoning. Practical decision-making, practical reasoning, I think, is no different. We make an inference to the best decision about what we ought to do. We use pattern recognition. We draw on past uh, memory infused as it is with evaluation. And we make an inference to the best decision. I think from the very earliest stages, and I think this is kind of demonstrably so in the case of nonverbal animals, perception, perceptual categorization is infused with value. It's pretty tough for my grandchildren not to see that and see it as something desirable, as something to be wary of. Poison ivy, they learn, and then I have a visceral reaction to poison ivy. I see it. I, the pattern recognition is there, but it's not clearly separable and so forth for other things. Do I think what I... How I'm thinking about this, and this may in the fullness of science turn out to be a, a clock as well, but I think representations, as we're coming to understand them, them within the context of the reward system and how it gets tuned up, representations usually are valence. That's how they come. And then you have to do this other fancy thing to get rid of it. Separation a fact from value, which we think is so dead obvious, from the point of view of the brain actually requires work. It's like milk, if I may retreat yet again to the farm. So it comes all, and the milk and the cream is all part, of it, and it takes a fancy device to separate uh, the facts from the values. So I think much of reasoning and, and here again, psychologists are, are, are really, really doing interesting work on this. Much of reasoning involves pattern recognition, similarity to a prototype, and vector completion. And I'm, just, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show that, but I want to show this. So that, just to take a simple example. Oh, actually, I should show you that. Have I got time to show up just a couple things? I'm, how am I doing, Roger? Doing I'm doing fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, but there are data. Okay. So, vector completion. 
Okay, can you roll it or should I be rolling it or what should I do? Okay, here we go. Next, help, meeting minder. All right, we're not. There we go. Okay, so you're actually getting very little. Um, but the motion, brains of course love deltas. Look at the deltas in this. Um, and we vector complete like crazy. And then one of the great things that modelers have helped us understand, people in Terry's lab, that I know Jeff Hawkins and other people, is what vector completion looks like in brains and how it's possible for all that spontaneous activity in the brain to create uh, these things. All right. So I'm going to argue that much of what we think of as reasoning is not classically deductive. It's not classically inductive. It's pattern recognition. And it's searching around for the right pattern. Is 9-11 similar to that, Pearl Harbor, or is it more similar to that? And sometimes the pattern recognition has to wait until we get more data. And I think that's kind of what reasoning is, too. Sometimes you say, I don't know. Let's find out from Scott Atran what he thinks about the people who perpetrated the horror. And then that gives you a very different pattern to recognize vis-a-vis. -vis. Anyway, um, so the, the main moral of this story is that I think we've got an awful lot to learn about what reasoning actually is. But that my hunch. And here I think, you know, Ronnie and I are probably in agreement that there's a lot that you can do, both from psychology and neuroscience, to get the real story and what reasoning is. But we've been sold this absolutely bizarre bill of goods that what, what scientists mostly do is induction. I mean, it's just so amazingly false as a matter of observational fact. That isn't what's going on almost ever. Um, in any case, I think these are really great, fun, interesting uh, issues. I'm not very political, just as I'm not very poetic, but I do think that the brain and all its mysteries is just about the most fun there is. Thanks.